Well, hello, everyone. Um, yep, we're here today to remember um, Oliver. And I want to, this, this is a strange kind of thing. It's a combination both of uh, an in memory of, of Oliver and also a sales pitch for um, the, the book. Um, and really want to emphasize the fact that you know, this was Oliver's brainchild. This was his idea. Uh, and I just, um, had the task of putting it together uh, afterwards uh, and to bring about the product that is out there for you to buy. £25 today, special offer, discounted down from 35 Now, a little bit about this. We're going to go back 10 years. Uh, and in early 2013, um, Ollie turned up in my office at Stirling. And I'd only met Oliver two or three times previously at conferences. I, I, I knew uh, the type of uh, area that he worked in, um, but I did not know that much about him generally. And he came in absolutely brimming with enthusiasm, but very, very nervous, um, and said, I've got this idea, but I can't get people to engage with it. Um, and I need somebody to be the front man. And it was one of these strange situations that people who are not in a full-time role within academia are frozen out of the means of applying funding for what might be an absolutely brilliant idea. And you know, at that stage, I was head of department, deputy um, uh, head of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, turning myself into a senior manager at the university. And the last thing, to be perfectly honest, I was thinking about was actually starting a research project, particularly one that was not mine. And we sat down and I, I gave Oliver all the reasons why I was not the right person to be taking this forward with him. He says, no, 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 you, you are. For a variety of reasons, one of them being because, you know, I work interdisciplinarily. Uh, that, that's where my environmental history side comes from. Uh, I've got a, a history and archeology span background. So I'm not one of these historians who has got tunnel vision that it's only the text um, that matters. And it was the understanding that you know, I was genuinely interested in what Oliver was offering, as well as having the administrative cloud. Because one of the things that I could do was give him the support of my faculty to deliver on this. So anyway, I've waffled around there about coming in with an idea. And what this idea was, came out of the work that he had been doing with Peter Yeoman at Schoon. And this was the work on the, the Moot Hill primarily, um, but with wider monastic site. And Oliver was absolutely convinced that here we had an opportunity to at least draw attention that you have got right across Northern and Western Europe, a series of monuments of major significance that were the origins, if you like, of our modern parliamentary democracies, um, these public venues, uh, inauguration and assembly places. And he was saying, you know, these things are looked at in isolation rather than being as part of um, a European identity building thing, a state making um, phenomenon. And so his idea was to start by taking Schoon and looking at it as the possible core around which we could build a, a collective World Heritage Site application, not just for Schoon, but for these monuments right across Northern and Western Europe. Now, that was one of the bits that got me a little bit more sceptical, but I thought, you know, what we do need to do here is draw attention to the fact that we have got a wealth of sites like this, of starting at late prehistory, but running right through the early medieval period into the later Middle Ages and on into the modern period that carried a significance at international, national, regional, local levels. And this, this was one of the things, if you remember, those of you who know Oliver's work, 
right back to his PhD, he was emphasising how these sites had a resonance that operated at multiple levels to different aspects of society. It was addressing needs on a local, very domestic level almost, all the way up to royal courts and how they interacted with each other across Europe. So there's emulation, uh, popping of ideas, sharing and exchange of ideas around about the development of these types of sites. And in some cases, they may be operating right down at grassroots level, as in the paper that I ended up doing for this, places where local people dealt with the infinity, as the abbot of our broth put it, of petty and significant little problems that only happen between peasants. So Oliver came in with this idea and we put it together and thought about how do we go about building on this idea. Oliver originally wanted to try and go for a, a big all singing, all dancing AHRC project. And that was where I sort of pulled him back a little and said, we've actually got nothing to take to AHRC to show them concrete, because there was no publication yet from Schoon. Uh, we didn't have the data to be able, because you know, what AHRC basically want you to do is present the results you're going to deliver of the project before you've done the project. So you need to be able to show them that there is something tangible. So we had to start more or less at um, a, a very low level. And the way we thought about doing this was network. And RSE had just launched a new um, network support grant. And we put together a proposal, fired it in in um, late 2013, and were absolutely delighted and not a little bit surprised when we got the funding. And that's when the real fun started, because Oliver had, if you remember, amongst Oliver's many things was community um, archaeology, community work generally. And we had put in a proposal, which was, it's not just going to be a bunch of boring old academic farts sitting around in a room talking about rarefied, you know, the, the intellectual processes by which the people who were developing these sites worked. This had to be something that was going to get across to a broad community, internationally as well as domestically, that these things mattered. How people on the ground at the time might have actually interacted with them. And so it had to be involving hands-on learning and genuine knowledge exchange and understanding of the sites. So we were putting together a program that was going to be very much one of public engagement, public interaction. Yet it had its academic component. There were conferences uh, in this, workshops, international community, um, using the network that Oliver had already built up, bringing in colleagues from all across Northern, uh, Central Europe, uh, Britain and Ireland. But it also had to work with the community in and around Perth because we were still focusing primarily on Schoon. And if you know the site, it's not really amongst the most inspiring of places. But this was to be the focus of everything that we were going to try to build. And so we started thinking about, right, how much is known about Schoon, even in Perth? How many people actually know the Moot Hill? How many people know that that thing on top of the Moot Hill is not Schoon Abbey? How many people actually know that if you get in amongst the Earl of Mansfield's house and take all the early 19th century casing off the outside of it, there is actually a 17th century mansion in there, which probably includes most of the guest house of the Abbey. And that we know from all his geophysics and the excavation that he and Peter did, we know where the Abbey itself lay. We know that this is actually not just some insignificant little church because everybody assumed, because there's no stones visible of it on actually in situ, it can't have been that impressive, that they demonstrated this is one of the biggest Augustinian abbey churches in Scotland. There's an enormous site of great significance here. 
And this was a place where we started to look and working with colleagues, build up a picture for local people to get a better understanding that this was Scotland's Westminster for the central part of the medieval period. And colleagues like um, Richard Miller in the audience here, who at that time was working on the, the charter books of the medieval abbey, building up a picture of how this monastery operated, how it interacted with that site, how inaugurations took place, how the interrelationship between services in the church, out into ceremonies outside, engaged a community beyond just the clergy in the church and the high nobles. And this was where working with Lucy Dean, now at the University of Highlands and Islands, who was working with children's entertainer and educator Paul Gorman, began to work with local school kids in um, S5 and S6 to start to put together programmes of their interpretation, not our interpretation, their interpretation of what an inauguration ceremony would have been like. They scripted it, they acted it, and it gave them a level of engagement with a site that most of them, and we're talking about people, including kids from Schoon itself, who'd never been here. And it's about trying to, to build on that kind of community engagement to make this relevant for wide audiences. And those of you who worked with Oliver know that this was one of his passions, that he had an ability to engage and enthuse audiences who might previously have had no interest in the past of their community. So what we really were trying to do was build a platform here to give us the evidence to show how these sites resonate or can resonate with communities. And this was part, again, of Oliver's placemaking and identity building agendas, something that he was very, very good at. And looking at how these sites gave identity to community now and in the past as these kind of focal places where uh, events took place. And those events could be everything from the law court through to the making of a ruler or the breaking of a ruler. We also realized that you know, we need to expand the community. So we had a wide cross section of artists, um, historians, um, archaeologists, reenactors, interpreters coming together to begin to look at how we can turn a place, and using Schoon still as the example, but a place that might not be hugely visually engaging, and how we can turn this into something that will be accessible to people. And so, with Richard Fawcett um, at, at that stage at the University of St Andrews, with um, the 3D visualisation team, the immersive 3D uh, team from the University of St Andrews, we began to do uh, reconstructions using the fragments of stone from the site. And, and Richard beginning to put together uh, an incredible uh, reconstruction of the church to give people an idea of the physical presence that there would have been on the site. Something that Jim Lindsay, um, the, the artist, took and put together in his two-dimensional uh, reimagining um, of the location. These sorts of things, using them as openings into um, a, a wider appreciation of the monument. So we began to physically, if you like, rebuild the setting in which these events were taking place. And this is something that then, working with colleagues from uh, Norway, uh, from Sweden, um, from the, the Czech Republic, um, and from Germany, we began to, to build up pictures of the same kinds of sites, whether it's Gamla Uppsala, uh, Trondheim, Kradshani, um, and Aachen, we began to get a, a, a sense that all across Europe you have got these focal points 
um, that were being used to give coherence in the great state building uh, process that was on from the, um, the late 8th century through into the 13th centuries. Some of them are relatively late developments, like the Trondheim site. Um, this, this is dating um, into the, the, the state formation period in the 12th and 13th centuries uh, in Norway. But we began to get a sense of all across Europe, these things as being a phenomenon. And we began to think, actually, we might have genuine grounds here for that World Heritage Site um, application after all. And this is just a contents page. It's a bit of a, again, a push for those of you who have not had a chance to look at the book yet. But this is just the list of those who managed um, to um, ultimately uh, put the papers um, together. Because at the end of the project, we had a great wealth of information. We'd had two major conferences. Um, we'd had various public gatherings. And Oliver began to put together the edited collection. And at that point, I thought, my job is done, and I faded off um, into the background. And then, very, very sadly, I got an email from Derek Hall um, giving me the news of Oliver's sad death. And it was one of those moments where you sat there and thought, ah, um, what do you do? There, there's... There's not very much you can say. Uh, I didn't know how to get in touch with Lindsay. Um, I, I, I didn't know what the next step should be. And various people said to me, well, you've got to finish the book. I thought, but I don't know what Oliver has done at this stage with the book. So I had to get around as many of the authors that I could think of, get them to resubmit papers. Some folk I wasn't able to get in touch it's because I didn't know what their um, contact details were anymore. But we managed to put together something that captured the spirit of what Oliver had been working on. The only thing, sadly, that is missing from this is Oliver's own contribution. But what we have is a book of two halves. The first is intended to focus on the driving passion that had been Oliver's work at Schoon, the thing that gave us that big initial push. And so the first group of papers is trying to set Schoon properly. I mean, seriously, folks, Schoon is possibly one of the most important sites culturally, historically, politically in Scotland. And yet it is still grossly misunderstood or just not understood. You know, those of you who are early medievalists or, or even high medievalists, how many of you have been there? This is the chief place of our kingdom. This is the king-making site. It is of immense importance in the formation of Scottish national identity in the medieval period. And this is the first time that we've actually managed to gather together a series of papers that tries to set it into its context. We, for the first time, have got papers that look at the inaugural process right across the medieval period. For the first time, we have got here an examination of the landholding of the medieval abbey. For the first time, we have got here a look at the last royal inauguration, the coronation of Charles II, one of the most misunderstood and misrepresented events, but a fascinating history uh, put together uh, by Alistair Mann. And then in the second half, we've got the work that builds on the project. This was the meat of what Oliver was trying to, uh, to push us towards. And the great papers in there 
Um, David Caldwell, brilliant work on Finlagen. He's done the paper on um, Schoon, uh, as I was saying to Nigel Ruckley earlier on this morning. Um, David is hugely irritated by the fact that just after he'd uh, sent back the final proofs on this, the Historic Environment Scotland released the new scan images um, of the, the stone. Um, David Rollison's paper, brilliant examination running from uh, Northumbria all the way um, through Europe. Uh, Austin Eckroll's paper on um, Trondheim Nidaros uh, that I've already mentioned. Uh, Jan Jungfist and, and Joachim Kjellberg's paper on Gamla Uppsala. My own contribution, which tries to pull together Oliver's own work. Look at some sites that Oliver didn't, but reconsider some of the sites that he looked at uh, in his PhD. And then um, Ollie's old mentor, um, with whom he did so much work uh, in the past uh, on geophysics, um, Erika Utzi, um, whose phenomenal work, both at uh, Dunfermline currently, um, but initially at Westminster, uh, really showed us um, what uh, ground penetrating radar in particular can do. It's a, it's a phenomenal collection, so I say it myself. And this is just a series of, of illustrations uh, to try and, 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 and emphasize the different points, the different papers. So, you know, David Caldwell um, with his very, very close examination of the stone, but also of its setting um, in both Schoon and at Westminster. The inauguration process looked at um, by, by Lucy Dean in very, very close detail, piecing together all the evidence we've got of where and how to make monarchs um, in Scotland. Previously unseen images of uh, Charles II's um, coronation in Alistair Mann's paper. Richard Fawcett, this is Richard's uh, initial session. Just, and he, he did that, not quite on the back of a fag packet, but it was on the back of an envelope in the middle of the conference. He sat there and sketched it out. And then from Richard Miller's paper, you're looking at you know, the, the wider assemblage um, that, that held the, the, the whole of the, um, the monastic estate uh, together. This is the, the church at, at Cambus Michael, beautiful um, late medieval parish church site. And then David Caldwell with the, the Finlagen examination, looking at other types of inaugural sites that carry on through um, the, the high medieval and late uh, medieval papers. Austin Eckerl looking at you know, a bunch of people in the 17th century standing around looking at a pile of stones. And you know, David um, McGovern, brilliant uh, examination of how to reimagine and use Pictish stones, the reimagining of what that pile of rubble uh, looked like is a phenomenal reconstruction. Uh, I thoroughly recommend even just flicking through and having a look at the pictures in the book to get a sense of what this is. And then you've got um, Gamla Uppsala giving a, 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 a real sense. One of the things that um, Ollie was very, very keen to emphasize, the continuities from the prehistoric and pagan past into the Christian future of the Middle Ages looked at at that great Swedish site. Then Rens, the display thrown overlooking the Rhine where the Holy Roman Emperor sat and looked out across his domain, the elevated place, again like Schoon, where the making of a king was visible to everyone, not just that privileged community within an enclosed church building. And then, no, it's not gone wrong. Um, this is, is one of um, Erica's um, GPR um, slides from uh, Westminster showing you know, the, the type of semi-process data from which um, Oliver was able to reconstruct um, the, the ground plan of uh, Schoon Abbey itself. And then moving on uh, to the end, I put these sites on not ju just to 
uh, emphasize my own contribution uh, to the book. These are uh, some of the things that, that I look at. But these were the places that actually inspired Oliver. These types of sites are the ones that you, you get a sense just by looking at them. Craigini in Glen Lyon there at the top. This is the now largely destroyed Standing Stones um, at Rain in Aberdeenshire, looking out across to Benachy in the background, or the inaugural site up at Dunad. These are magical locations. You can get the sense how Oliver enthused and engaged with them. And it was reminding me that these are what he's talking about, these places that mattered to people, where law was seen to be done, where kings were made, where great assemblies were gathered together. These are the places that actually made us what we are today. And we need to understand them better. And this book is the first step in trying to get it understood better. And so I'll end with Oliver again. We didn't get the World Heritage Site application put together, but Oliver did put down a marker that these are sites that we need to think about not as isolated single examples of something, but as part of a collective whole that gave our nation an identity that was on a par with national identities being formed all across Western Europe at the same time. And with that, I commend the book to you. <laughs> Read all about it. Special offer, £25. Thank you.